Very good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us this beautiful Saturday morning for what I'm sure will be a most enlightening session. The idea of the all-party parliamentary group on the SDGs kicked off with the Budget 2020 announcement by then Finance Minister Lim Guan Eng and the pilot project involving 10 out of 222 parliamentary constituencies began in January this year. The project aspires to localize the SDGs in a meaningful way with members of parliament acting as champions of the SDGs within their local constituencies. Hence the theme of this morning's webinar, taking it to the ground, the work of the APPGM SDG. When Anthony Tan, uh, our beloved president of the JSC Student Club, broached the idea of this sharing session exclusively for the students of the Masters in Sustainable Development Management, I immediately jumped on the idea. We both agreed that this important work uh, serves as a valuable life case study of local solutions in action. A few weeks ago, the Jeffrey Sachs Centre had a meeting with Professor Datuk Denison Jayasuria who heads the Secretariat of the APPGM SDG. And from that meeting, I'm very happy to announce that the Jeffrey Sachs Centre is ready to offer our support as a partner in the next phase of this initiative. And uh, it is something that we are most honoured to be a part of. Prof Dennison, you certainly convinced us. On behalf of the Jeffrey Sachs Centre, I would like to thank Prof Dennison for his dedication towards the cause of localizing the SDGs for so many years now. Likewise, I wish to thank all the panelists this morning, um, Mr. Alizan Mahadi, Dr. Lin Mui Kiang, Dr. Zainal Abidin Sanusi, and Ms. Noor Rahma Othman for agreeing to be with us this morning and uh, for, for your respective roles in the APPGM SDGs. We look forward to hearing your sharing with us today. Last but not least, I thank Anthony Tan, who is also the finance officer of the APPGM SDG, and without whom this morning's sharing session would not be possible. It gives me great pleasure now to hand over to him to begin and moderate the session. Over to you, Anthony. Thank you, Karen, and good morning to everyone. <clears throat> I think this uh, this uh, session is uh, the closest that uh, the uh, Masters in Sustainable Development Management group has as a reunion after completing our uh, studies. Um, well, our student life has ended. Uh, for some of us, we are planning to go for permanent hair damage. <laughs> uh, and uh, well, it, 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 this journey, I think, uh, with the uh, MSDM has been very, very interesting. Uh, and for me personally, uh, it has been uh, fruitful in the sense that it has helped me to better understand the complexities of bringing the uh, uh, SDGs down to the ground. Uh, in Malay, uh, the word uh, grounded is uh, mem Bumi kan. Uh, we had some difficulty in actually uh, differentiating that from memperbumikan. Uh, memperbumikan is to ground it, memperbumikan is to bury it. So, uh, yeah, so memperbumikan is to, to ground it. Um, uh, without further ado, uh, I, I'd like to, to bring on board Dr. Denison Jayasurya, who is, uh, I, I call him Bordi by boss. He's the head of the APPGM SDG Secretariat. He's also the co-chair of the CSO SDG Alliance. Over to you, Dr. Denison. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, thank you for organizing and arranging this. Uh, also thank Karen and the Sunway um, uh, University to uh, enable your master students to have an interaction, I think, practically with the senior team 
from the APPG Secretariat. So, so I think it will be an uh, interesting presentation and also an exchange of ideas. Huh? Now, I think the bulk of the sharings would be done by um, uh, Ali Zan and Dr. Lin uh, in the area of focus. So I thought I will set the context and uh, set as an introduction to what APPG is uh, and also the idea of localizing. I think after a full master's program, I think Anthony told me he, he has got through and now he is moving to the next phase of from masters to PhD, yeah, Anthony. Um, but all those who have graduated, you are welcome to join us in the secretariat. At this point, it's all volunteers going down uh, on localizing with uh, small claims for reimbursement, uh, for travel and things like that. But that's possible to get your hands on the grounded aspect. Now, the old party parliamentary group uh, is a concept that the Parliament of Malaysia in the reform agenda of 2018, when PH came into, uh, into as government, uh, and the previous uh, Speaker of Parliament wanted an increased engagement of Parliament uh, and the citizens, parliament and government, parliament and business, parliament and civil society. So he hosted a series of discussions on parliamentary reform and engagement. Then parliament also introduced the select committees. Select committees are committees of parliament, which has um, uh, inquiry um, powers, uh, and, and it's composed of only members of parliament uh, who take up a particular area uh, like finance or specific areas like human rights, gender, environment or some particular area. Uh, and, and then uh, the select committees bring out a report which is tabled in parliament. Now, when the, when the society, uh, the Malaysian CSO SDG Alliance, approached the Speaker of Parliament to set up uh, some kind of group under SDG, the first suggestion was a select committee or a caucus, uh, so that there will be monitoring, there'll be some thinking. The Speaker of Parliament, because he had visited England and been exposed, he introduced the all-party parliamentary group uh, concept uh, to us and then we got better acquainted and we made some uh, subsequent proposals which eventually in October 2019 was tabled in parliament as a, as a resolution of the house in which the late law minister uh, read the resolution of the government uh, to the setting up of APPGMs that there could be more than one uh, and SDG as the first and they also named the Malaysian CSO SDG Alliance as the secretariat. Now that background is helpful for us to say that it has parliamentary endorsement uh, and there are a number of features. I want to highlight seven, which will be well illustrated. I'll just list them. I'm not going to give a long talk on it. First is that the APPGM is a parliamentary approved committee or group of people. Second, it is bipartisan. That means the chairman of the APPG must be from a political party of the government and their members can come from all parties uh, and in this case we have PKR, uh, we have the Sarawak party, we have PAS, we have Bursatu, so some are in the government and some are now the opposition with the change there was some change but it's bipartisan 
I think by far in all the political controversies on SDG, the committee has been intact uh, as a bipartisan group. So that's the second point. Third is it's multi-stakeholder, as in SDG 17, multi-stakeholder meaning it's parliament from both houses of parliament. Uh, it can include government servants, but definitely civil society, academia, think tanks, even people from private sector and people from the grassroots. So multi-stakeholder is an important concept and as a permanent sort of a group uh, endorsed by parliament that enhances the multi-stakeholder engagement and process, which Alizan and Dr. Lin uh, would highlight. Uh, that's the third point. The fourth point is, after this establishment and so forth, when we presented to the Ministry of Finance in a dialogue, they were open to the idea of financing parliamentary select committees. So 3 million was set aside for that and 2 million was set aside for SDGs in the sense of the work of the APPG on SDG on um, uh, localizing. So that's an important concept. Uh, fifthly, the policy dialogues with the economic planning unit was enhanced. Less last year, but we were part of the national SDG uh, discussions. But this year increased uh, in the inputs to the 12th Malaysia plan, multi-dimensional uh, multi poverty and so forth. Uh, that's the fifth point. So policy is a component. But the main component that will be highlighted both by Alizan and Dr. Lim is localizing SDGs, local issues, identification, and local solutions in a decentralized way that involves district level involvement. Uh, and finally, uh, policy implications uh, for, uh, for this process, which I highlighted in the EPU context. So that sets the background to possibilities of a structure, modalities of operation, and taking SDGs from Putrajaya to 10 district level and enhancing that. So those are my introductory words. And if there are questions later, or towards the end, I can also sum up uh, some lessons learned from this. So Anthony, back to you and to the team. Thank you for this opportunity. Maybe, maybe some of the future students might want to study some specific aspect uh, of a partnership or going to the ground on specific areas. That might be the next step. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dennison. Um, now I'd like to introduce two key people uh, in the research, uh, the co-leaders for the research team. Uh, the first is uh, Inchi Alizan Mahadi. He's from the Good ISIS, ISIS Malaysia, uh, and uh, uh, a director of a, a department called TIES. Uh, he will, I believe he will explain what that uh, entails. And of course, uh, Dr. Zainal Abidin Sanusi is the director of uh, Sejahtera Center. Our inside joke is he's always Sejahtera. Um, so over to you, Alizan and Dr. Zainal. Thank you, Anthony. I think I will begin, Dr. Zainal. So uh, good morning, everyone. And first of all, thank you, uh, Anthony, Karen, and the uh, Jeffrey Speck Center for Sustainable Development for inviting me today. Uh, yes, as Anthony mentioned, I'm from the Good ISIS. Uh, I've actually uh, recently changed my title, actually, Anthony, is Director of Research because then it's, oh. because it's, it's too long, Technology, Innovation, Environment and Sustainability. So uh, <laughs> I'm the Director of Research at, at, at ISIS Malaysia. And um, as Dr. Dennison mentioned, um, think tanks are also part of uh, this network. So just to begin with, I think that's one of the most interesting aspects of the APPG and, and the larger CSO SDG Alliance, where we have had a participation from really multiple stakeholders, um, including civil society, academia, think tanks, and now um, with the APPG, we also bring in parliamentarians. 
Okay, before I, I really begin, I think Dr. Denson gave a comprehensive introduction already, but the idea of, of localizing SDGs and, and, and uh, I think this, the title today is, is quite apt, taking SDGs to the ground, is that I think everyone who's been working in the context of development generally in Malaysia, in particular sustainable development, knows that one of the key challenges is in terms of localizing, localizing not just the SDGs, but translating it to the local levels. And one of the core challenges in the context of Malaysia is that our um, capacity of our local governments, etc., is is lacking. And, um, and therefore, there's a bit of um, a challenge to localize it to the local levels. And this is due to many reasons, for example, uh, lack of local elections and so on. So the idea of the APPG is to work with the parliamentarians as local champions. So this is quite a novel approach in itself. Um, internationally, when we talk about localizing SDGs, people will work with local governments, but in the context of Malaysia, we have tried to use the convening power um, and the influence of the parliamentarians at the local level to take the SDGs to the ground. Just uh, next slide, please, Anthony. Um, this is just to show that when we talk about localizing, this is just to show that we have been working with different researchers on the ground, mostly from the ground. So um, it is one a collaborative effort, but also it's important to note when we when we talk about localizing SDGs, it's quite important to have also the knowledge and the expertise of the local researchers. So we have been working with researchers uh, in uh, IIUM, in University of Malaysia Sabah, Sabah, UNIMAS in Sarawak, uh, and so on. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this is just a general introduction of the activities of APPG. Um, the first is to map local issues, um, solutions and networks. Secondly, is to do policy research on local constituent issues. Third is the preparation of policy papers. Also in the meantime, we do SDGs awareness programs. And finally, because this is part of the uh, parliamentary process, ultimately we want a policy discussion among parliamentarians. Now, what is interesting there is, again, the mandate really of parliamentarians is for national, uh, you know, uh, policy making and national uh, legislation, not not actually, they don't actually really have a local mandate, but again, the unique circumstances in Malaysia is that um, the parliamentarians actually play an important role at the local level. So one of the key things here in our methodology is to link the two together, the local issues, as well as bring it up for policy discussions at the national level. Okay, next slide. So uh, just briefly, in our phase one, uh, as I mentioned, the key thing is mapping of local issues in the parliamentary constituencies. Uh, we do this by having basically a three-day visit that is coordinated uh, well, by the Secretariat and also by the Parliamentarian Office to involve multiple stakeholders. What we do in the three-day visit is we meet uh, government agencies, we meet local champions, local stakeholders and local NGOs. So we have a few sessions and we also do site visits to some of the areas that are identified as um, those being uh, left behind the most. So within those three day visits, we, we, you know, we look at observations and we start to map those issues in accordance with the SDGs. Um, we also identify the capacity building and awareness raising activities and also identify some of the solutions I think that Dr. Lin will present later. Um, we are now at our phase two, so you know, the projects are commencing, but from the research component, we are continuing more in-depth studies on um, validating our observations on the three-day visit, as well as really going to more in-depth, why are the delivery issues occurring? You know, is it, for example, due to leakages within the process? Is it due to uh, political interference? Is it due to uh, simply inefficiency and so on? And finally, we will produce an integrated report. Um, next slide, please. I won't go into detail, but the key thing here is when, when we talk about SDGs, when we do the issue mapping, I think I've been involved in quite a few um, 
you know, kind of a few processes to map issues of SDGs. And one of the, the, the challenges to that is most people are not aware of the SDGs. And therefore, sometimes when we go to ground or, or we go even sectorally or so on, there's always this uh, activity where you try to map it directly to the SDGs. And in, my, in our experience in the APPG, it, that's you know due to the lack of awareness on SDGs is very challenging if we were to do that so our process is really bottom up it's quite simple we ask them what are the most crucial issues across cutting across social economic environmental uh, within the parliamentary location so we just ask very simple questions what are the most pressing issues that that they are facing currently and then we probe a bit more further and then the 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 researchers the the um, the coordinators we will translate that into the SDGs. So next slide, please. So yes, yeah, so in this slide, we just shows, you know, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but the, the idea, especially with the topic today, when we talk about taking the SDGs to the ground, we should not mistake that to be um, looking at SDGs as this international instrument that we need to implement at the ground level. It's a two-way interaction. The SDGs act as a guiding framework, yes, but there are unique challenges, there are unique circumstances at the ground level, and the ground level will also contribute towards um, reframing the SDGs as well. So again, through our issue mapping methodology, we ask the community simply, what are the pressing issues um, that are occurring at the ground level? And then um, I would say the researchers act as a kind of translators, they translate these challenges into um, the context of SDGs. Now what that does is a couple of things. One, um, the SDGs acts as kind of a checklist to, um, to the challenges um, identified by the stakeholders. And I'll give you an example. Um, again, the, the most simple, I think, example that, that keeps on occurring everywhere is, is uh, uh, is the issue with waste. So when we talk about waste at the local level, many people see it as simply an issue of um, uh, waste collection, for example, because there are many areas that there's no waste collection. But actually, because of that waste, there are uh, various impacts to health, which is not identified um, by the uh, stakeholders perhaps, but there are various issues with environment because, for example, one area that we looked into, the, the waste was in the, uh, in the rivers, etc. So here, I think the key thing is that there needs to be the researchers, the experts to really frame it, frame it in the context of SDGs. Um, am I taking too much time, Anthony? Is it okay? Uh, okay, it's okay. Okay, so next slide, please, because I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Zain now. Next slide, please. Okay, yes, this slide. Um, so, so our, our findings, is, as you can see, this is just mapping out some of the prioritized issue er, issues they are quite contextual. And this is the challenge both with national development as well as the SDGs in general. But what is interesting is by using the SDGs, we can find some really contextual issues that occur in the different constituencies. For example, in Pandang, um, the issues are about land ownership and about agriculture. In, in Jeli, uh, there's, uh, the issue is mostly on smallholder dependency, especially in terms of the dependency on rubber. In Selayang, there's an issue of, of um, um, migrant and refugees, and especially the rights of the migrants and refugees. In PJ, the issue is about urban poverty, especially in the PPRs and the low-cost flats. In Tanjung Pi, despite being the tip of, of Eurasia, they have a very undeveloped uh, tourism industry. In Bentong, despite being famous for Bentong ginger and having fertile land, many of the agricultural land is due to uh, is, um, uh, uh, is based on cash crops and plantations. In Kuching, the, the focus uh, was on um, the squatter areas in Kuching. In Batang Sadong, there is a situation where they have a lot of agriculture.
agricultural produce, but there is no market to sell it. In Pensiangan, you've got an issue of uh, community development, especially gender equality, where there are, for example, occurrences, uh, high occurrences of uh, child marriages still. And in Papa, there's a development impact on agricultural community due to some of the mega projects. So this is just to show that we need to, you know, the SDGs won't solve everything, but it can identify some of the contextual issues that occur at the local level. And therefore there's no silver bullet, both at the national and international level to address this. And there needs to be a process and a structure that is more bottom up. I think I'll stop there, and I'll pass it to Dr. Zainal to give his reflections as well. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, thank you, Alizan. Uh, but Anthony, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll be sharing a slide as well. If Alizan can uh, stop sharing so that I can put mine on. All right, quickly, yeah. Uh, um, I, I, I was thinking of trying to somehow uh, how to put all the experience on the ground, reflecting what Alison has shared. Uh, there's a lot of anecdotes on the ground, but I'm trying to put uh, in the context of uh, my assumption is that these are students of master's studies in the department, and whereby it reminds me of uh, talking of the same thing, of the research experience that we do on the ground with the uh, students of master's PhD in sustainability, sustainable development in Tokyo University. So there are three things that I would like to somehow uh, try to bring in the context of research and, and, and approach that uh, as a reflection of what we have done uh, on the ground, uh, visiting six, seven uh, um, constituencies. Yeah? I'm trying to put in the keyword of what sustainable development is implying on research and approach on the ground based on the experience that we had. Okay, first, there are three points I would like to say. One, we realize that uh, when we do the research, we are trying to somehow really see on the ground that is, is the research that we're doing, is the field work that we're doing really bringing impactful as, as far as our research back in the university's concept. So what Alizan is saying that uh, is, is quite interesting when you put it, all the agendas, objective on the ground, it's not as beautiful as we discussed in the, in, in the classroom. Yeah? Then we've got to realize and be reminded that uh, you have to tweak here and there that all the theories, even theories of sustainable development, is not necessarily easily work on down there when you talk to the people on the ground. They, they can't really see, although we talk about our oh, sustainable development is about poverty, which is really close to them, but yet if our bigger perspective and, and, and academic framework is still of impact general, etc., you want to bring it down, you really have to tweak it there. Yeah? Um, and that's why I guess I, I would like to highlight that the, the experience also tell us that uh, uh, we are still lacking of real experience that is put into general etc. that really reflect what needs to be done, what kind of approach that is really uh, important when we want to bring these kind of issues on the ground. Yeah? Uh, because I think uh, at the end of the day, uh, imagine some of the researchers, some of the people have uh, never been in community engagement, one, and two, never been in that area whereby, uh, let's say, for example, last month we were in Rohingya group, uh, tried to clean up the sampah uh, surrounding their house. So if you are in that position, there's a lot of uh, um, academic things or uh, things that we've never done before. So what I'm trying to say here is that the uh, unless and until you really get to the ground, all those things that you've been taught, the theories and practical in the classroom sustainable environment is still going to be questions. Yeah? Are we seriously about giving impact to the society that we have to leave behind some ideal aspect of even sustainable environment on the ground? The second component is that the research, like exactly what uh, uh, Alizan is trying to highlight, this is all about interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary. Yeah, we would, I mean, I myself, for, for, for being, being uh, having gone to the several constituencies, I really, only now that I really feel the lacking of my, my so-called knowledge before on the other uh, perspective of sociology, anthropology, and so many other transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary things. Yeah, why do we say that? Because I think we have been so much framed by uh, C.P. Snow and uh, of like two dichotomy, the 
social science, right? So what, what I'm trying to say here is that try to face the people on the ground and bring whatever your argument and then you get to see, yeah? You really get to see people of like, you are talking to a person from uh, 10 years old, a kid from the school, and then at the same meeting, uh, on the same discussion, the same half, there are people of like 70 years old and you're trying to talk about don't use plastic. So then you really uh, have to flex your knowledge muscle from discipline that you have until the general knowledge that you have. So the idea here is that then I start to realize that I'm going for transitionary. I'll forget all this disciplinary perspective that I have because facing that real society out there, you can't be living with that discipline or department perspective. Yeah? And academically, uh, this is sustainable development. This is one of the main mantra that we have moved from a mode one mode two to mode three science. Uh, mode three means we all bring in the, the community. And this is what I treasure most. When we go to, I think it was in Papa, uh, you've got stateless children there. Uh, and then you, all this while you hear it from enforcement agency and etc., which may be a very different perspective. But when you really go to the ground, the schools are dinding yang dah wobo nak goyang dan sebagainya. How do you solve this? How do you how do you respond to the community? Okay, and and you, I mean this this thing that uh, I face, I can't imagine yeah until I get to the ground because I thought I understand enough that when you talk about motri, when we talk transdisciplinary, I thought we can face this before. But still, yeah, uh, uh, and we have that little bit of ego that oh maybe these people don't know, but they don't care whether they know or not because these are the realities that they are facing to live in. Yeah, uh, I'll skip that one. So last one, I think the most important skill set that I'm still learning that I start to really realize that uh, when we bring in young lecturers or new researchers or our PhD students, for them to be able to conduct the question. Sometimes we prepare the question and etc. So when you face that group of people, they just read it directly. Means that it's just word by word reading it and the, the, the community doesn't seem to understand what we talk about. Yeah, what, what was the question about? Which I think uh, this is something that you can't get in the classroom. Yeah. So the training, the kind of training that you really get to let the students uh, face it's on the ground. So my last note is that um, we really try to somehow uh, get to understand and really immerse that when we do research, when we do engagement with the community, whatever idea that we talk about, we may come from academic background where the, the ideas may be developed from a different social economics uh, or social dynamics. Yeah? It may not be appropriate. Yeah? And then we talk about something, a new technology to save plastic, necessary, which may not be affordable. And then, uh, last one, uh, second, the, the other one is that we may be talking to the community that something that uh, we thought is good enough, is very sustainable, very environmental, but it's not accessible to them. And last one, we might be coming in, talking to the ground, saying that we thought the technology is available, the solution is available, but it's not. Yeah? So with that, uh, I would wrap by saying that uh, real uh, things that I treasure most is that Unless and until we go down and face the society with diverse, different interests that sometimes we, sometimes we think is illogical question, but those are their real life questions. Thank you so much, Anthony and Aliza. Thank you, Dr. Zainal. Uh, Aliza, uh, would you like to uh, add in to uh, your earlier presentation? Um, no, no, nothing to add. I think, thank you, Dr. Zainal has just presented very well the reflections uh, that tied into the um, presentation. So we will uh, welcome, of course, any questions perhaps at the end of the um, session. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Alizan and Dr. Zainal. Uh, perhaps I, I, I'd like to take this opportunity to share one experience I had in Kuching where uh, uh, we visited a, a squatter area, uh, the name of it is Kampung Chawan, uh, and it is built above a Chinese graveyard, not next to a Chinese graveyard, but above a Chinese graveyard. Meaning if you uh, open Ibrahim. up the Ibrahim. floor, 
you will find a Chinese grave under the house. Uh, and uh, quite sadly, uh, just as the, the project was uh, gathering up steam, uh, there was a case of uh, trying to, to uh, bulldoze down the whole uh, community. But uh, thankfully, uh, with the help of the MP and others, the, the, the bulldozing was stopped just in time. Uh, I'd like now to introduce Dr. Lin Moikyang. Uh, she's the head of our solutions. Um, she is our local uh, iron lady. She makes sure that all the projects are up to mark. So over to you, Dr. Lin. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. And thank you, Karen and Sunway for having us. So um, the hard work of uh, Alisan and uh, Dr. Zainal on the ground to uh, identify issues, prioritize issues, then we, uh, then we try to uh, uh, design projects to address these issues. So uh, basically, we have divided them into two, two categories. The first one is capacity building. And next, uh, Anthony. Next slide, yeah. yeah. So uh, the two categories are capacity building which are, being, are carried out for government agencies from federal, state, local levels, NGOs, community leaders and communities on the SDG principles and how they're relevant to them in their work and daily lives. Because most, almost all the people we met have, never, have not heard of the SDGs, including government servants. And they range from a half day sessions or for communities, government servants or to join sessions among them to increase understanding and also there are also sessions to resolve issues on specific subject matter. Next uh, right. So for the uh, capacity building for the race SDG awareness, uh, we have uh, quite a standard number of courses for almost for eight constituencies and they are carried out by the local universities and uh, Sajatra Centre is carrying out for four or five cent uh, constituencies. It's for SDG awareness and mainstreaming. And then we have a variation which is done in PJ through cultural mapping. And the third, the, third the form is uh, more universalized to embrace world citizenship and localized SDG in Pendang. And uh, apart from the SDG awareness, we also have specific issue specific capacity building sessions. The first one was, is a public forum on a Papa Dam, which is causing a lot of concern among the uh, residents in the area. And uh, PACOS is going to carry out a public forum to brief them on the water management situation in Sabah and also to discuss what are the actions to, to recommend actions that can be taken by the communities along the river. And uh, the second is on rights and responsibilities awareness for the low-cost housing residents in Salayang because they have so many problems there and uh, they need to be uh, made aware of their rights and responsibilities. Many are not paying rent, many are dirtying up the place and so forth. And the third one is to understand the needs of the squatter communities in Kuching. This is what uh, Anthony just mentioned, because they have been totally neglected. They are not even aware of government uh, welfare aid and so forth. And the uh, fourth one is the awareness of women and child rights, legislation and health in Persiangan where there's a very high level of uh, um, child marriages, violence against women, health issues, high mortality rate of mothers, young mothers who give birth and so forth. So this, uh, this is to create awareness of uh, what they can do. And then the next one is coaching youth in seeking employment in Persiangan to uh, raise their confidence and uh, teach them how to um, seek jobs and apply for jobs. 
The next one is on natural farming processes and composting workshop in Bentong to teach uh, community members on how to do natural farming to reduce chemicals and so forth. And a local preneur workshop on community centered business in Pendang to help them uh, identify businesses, how to uh, register them and how to uh, source for funds. And the last one is the workshop between Rista Felda and the local community in Jelly, where subsidiaries from uh, Rista and Felcra have been taking over and managing the uh, small holdings in return for dividends and so forth, but the smallholders have never received any dividends for many years. So this, these sessions are to help them resolve the issues among the uh, Rista and Felcra subsidiaries with the farmers and to uh, inject more transparency. And the uh, second category of interventions are solution projects. And uh, these solution projects are designed to address the issues and challenges identified during the field visits and discussions with the MPs, office, government agencies, NGOs, community leaders and the community community and they are very wide ranging uh, and cover many sectors including uh, education including education health waste management skill training entrepreneur development economic projects and community development. So the first sector we have, we are covering is education and we have these projects under the education sector and enhancement of English language proficiency for teachers in Batang Sodong, where you know teachers posted there are not able to teach English. So the whole, the students there have not been able to learn English and uh, we are having a project to train the teachers on how to teach English. And the uh, second project is uh, education project in uh, low cost housing in the Basubang. This is uh, to provide the tuition for primary and uh, secondary school, as well as uh, extra curriculum activities to increase their joy in learning, as well as Kotong Royong to, uh, to uh, promote harmony in the, uh, in the PPR flats. And, uh, Third one is tuition for primary and secondary school students in the squatter area in the Kampong Chawang uh, from, from preschool, primary school and uh, exam preparation for the secondary students. And the uh, last one is basic Malay spoken language learning and cultural senti sensitivizing because as you know, Selayang has very high uh, numbers of uh, refugees and migrant workers and they face a lot of problems among themselves and with the locals. So this is to try to at least you know, help them to speak basic Malay and uh, to, to make them aware of their cultural sensitivities. Next one. Next, uh, Anthony. Yes, and the next sector is health. And this covers the health screening in, uh, and assessing social assistance schemes in healthcare and cancer care in Bentong. When the uh, research team uh, led by Ali Zain and Dr. Zainal went to the ground, you know, we are surprised also to sometimes uh, come across, you know, health problems in uh, pockets around the uh, communities. And uh, it came across a pocket of uh, cancer sufferers in uh, Bentong. And the second one is the health awareness program for TB in ben Batang Sadong. And uh, we're also doing a screen breast cancer awareness screening in uh, Batang Sadong and there are, there are wellness workshops for the women in Persiangan. Next one. The next one is Persiangan as mentioned just now by Alisan uh, regarding waste management. In Tanjung Kuei, there is a very serious problem and uh, we'll be doing a little cleanup and buyback scheme to uh, address this unsustainable living conditions and little problem in the uh, water settlements in Tanjong Pai because uh, the 
the serious the problem is very serious but no government agency is responsible for waste and garbage in our water in rivers in water in oceans in the sea so this has accumulated for so long and uh, and uh, we are trying to have this project to address this problem waste management and economic empowerment in persiangan where they will be uh, doing recycling and trying to reclaim uh, and uh, reuse as well as to add value to the uh, waste collected and uh, they will also be uh, producing compost for farming as well as to introduce hydroponic agriculture to the community and uh, next one is refurbishment of the Matmore flats in Salayang and uh, the leach bin storage will be rebuilt and uh, leach bins will be uh, replaced and the community will be taught how to dispose of their garbage and the last one is uh, interagency government dialogue in PJ where they will also be discussing on how to overcome this problem next one skills training uh, due to the COVID and uh, MCO and so forth many people losing jobs so we are really going into skills training to help people find alternative employment the first one is on cafe and bakery training bakery skills training in Salayang and also in barrister skills and uh, next one is uh, micro social enterprise management in Salayang this will be a, for a group of women in a cafe uh, they'll be taught the five the four p's produce uh, pricing promotion and uh, place how to choose a good location and then uh, we have air conditioning training for youth in Salayang uh, they have already managed to find employers who are who are willing to who are keen to take these uh, uh, graduates and they will also be in uh, organizing a skills fair exhibition for holistic transformation skills training program in Salayang and uh, another skills training course is for digital marketing workshop for existing businessmen to go online to sell next one entrepreneur development there's the development of the uh, go tanjong pi ecotourism uh, this is uh, where the uh, local youth are being trained to identify assets in the community uh, whether it is cultural relics uh, night, good places to go to, restaurants, museums, and uh, and uh, they'll be taught how they are being taught how to uh, make them into uh, very good online materials, videos, TikToks, photography, and so forth, and to link up with uh, uh, global uh, uh, trip advisors. Uh, hotels, tourism, promotion bodies, and so forth. And the next one is in uh, Jelly, ecotourism social enterprise. This, uh, they will be and identify what are the local products and the local locations that can be promoted in an uh, ecotourism project. And the uh, next one in Pendang is also to uh, introduce ecotourism and community-centered business and uh, they will create an incubator there for all the lo local community members to uh, participate in. And the next list are on economic projects to enhance marketing and promotion of farmers and SME produce in Batang Sadong, as mentioned by Alison just now. They have a lot of produce, but they are not able to market it anywhere, even in the close by Kuching. So they will be uh, coming up with a lot of uh, plans on uh, to promote their products and they'll be having a big carnival, both uh, physical and uh, online. The next one is a government, women's income, women's sewing project in Batang Sadong. They have started uh, training the women on sewing and uh, looking for markets. And uh, soup kitchen, women's soup kitchen in the PPR Mentari Petaling Jaya. So uh, a group of women have been taught to cook and, uh, and uh, they have been uh, operating as a soup kitchen and lately they have also 
gone into catering and uh, later on they will also want to go into event management as well. And there's an um, agro project for paddy farmers in Papar uh, to provide irrigation and uh, also to train the youth in farm mechanization. And Siakap farming in, in uh, Papar as well uh, to uh, build a hatchery as well as to sell the uh, fish. And catfish farming in uh, jelly, mushroom cultivation in jelly, organic farming for orang asli in Bentong, and uh, to help them, to link them with uh, fair trade markets. And the uh, final last one is on improved orang asli innovation products in jelly, because they have a lot of traditional products, but it is not being uh, preserved and captured and promoted. So this is what the project will aim to do. And the last category is on uh, community development, slum incubation project in Kampong Chawan, where there was a um, um, needs assessment survey done with every household in Kampong Chawan, and they listed uh, many uh, of their, their needs and uh, we have uh, prioritized them and finally to to finalize the project with uh, provide helping them assess uh, social welfare uh, tuition or um, education from uh, preschool primary school secondary school and also how to uh, provide some irrigation to provide flooding in their squatter area and also to help them uh, repair some of the planks connecting the houses and uh, two bridges that connect them to the outside. And then we have the refurbishment of uh, Taman Slayang Makmo flats to make it more uh, uh, to be uh, repaired and also to make it cheer more cheerful for the flat dwellers. And then we have the Tele Film Generasi Bentong to uh, it is actually a video to to help uh, connect youth and also to promote harmony among the in the community. And then we have the SDG Solution Dialogue and Action Plan for Pendang community, where uh, the research team has found that uh, there are problems faced by different communities in Pendang, like the uh, Siamese community which have land ownership problem for many years and uh, has, which have not been resolved. And then there is another Indian community which are living in uh, abandoned estate quarters for many years as well. And then there are problems for the paddy farmers and also the felder rubber planters. So uh, this dialogue will be uh, connecting all of them to try to come up with uh, recommendations and action plan to resolve them with the government agencies. The government agencies will be uh, included from the beginning. And the next one is interagency government dialogue in Pataling Jaya. This is also to connect all the uh, stakeholders in PJ to come up with uh, needs assessment, recommendations and action plan. And the next one is a production of a guide on post-COVID crisis management for Pataling Jaya. And uh, finally, the, there will be a household census of residents in Tamang Selayang Makmo to identify what are the uh, actions which are needed to uh, address short, uh, more further needs in the future. And among all these projects, uh, there are six of them which are actually dealing with uh, women's empowerment. Uh, Next one, oh, no, okay. go back to that. So uh, there are all together 22 capacity building sessions and there are 32 solution projects. And uh, and all, some of these can be scaled up in fact, all of them can be scaled up and many of them can be replicated in other locations and constituencies as well. 
So it is a learning process, but, but we really feel that we can, uh, based on our experience, to expand much further in future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lin, for that uh, very comprehensive overview of the 22 um, capacity building and 32 projects. Uh, just to just to uh, uh, reiterate that um, these are uh, small small funded capacity building and and projects. Uh, the capacity buildings uh, for each constituency. Uh, allocation of 8,800 has been made for the projects uh, 120,000. So uh, if you look at the the uh, whole spectrum of uh, capacity building and even projects, uh, projects would would be generally be in the region of 20,000 to about 80, 80, 90,000, depending on on the size and the constituency. Uh, number one uh, to recap what. Uh, Alizan mentioned earlier and also what uh, Dr. Zainal said, one size does not fit all. Uh, the development within the country, there are, there are uh, different needs in different communities as what Dr. Lin had presented earlier. Um, development in Tanjung Pi, uh, the needs are very, very different from what is in Penang or in Jali. Uh, what's in Selayang is different from what is in uh, uh, Banda Kuching or Batang Sadong. Um, so we've heard uh, from Dr. Ganison on what the APPGM is from uh, Inche Alizan and also Dr. Zainal on how the research was done, how the prioritization of uh, the um, issues and then uh, with Dr. Lin, what are the actions that are being taken. So I'd like now to introduce uh, the person who does most of the work uh, behind the scenes, and usually she doesn't like to show her face, but today uh, I think we all managed to uh, convince her that uh, it's time for her to, to come to the forefront. I'd like to introduce uh, uh, our um, program officer, uh, No Rahma, and uh, over to you, Rahma. Yeah, thank you so much, Anthony. I'm really sorry, but I think I have to continue continue without my video on. My home Wi-Fi is a bit unstable this morning. So whenever I try to turn on my video, uh, I've been, uh, you know, uh, I got signed out automatically. Okay. All right. So yes, thank you, Anthony. Um, without further delay, thank you so much, uh, JSC, for the opportunity. And Mr. Anthony Tan, the moderator of the day. Uh, I think uh, being the last speaker, most of the thing has been um, covered by the previous speakers. But uh, just allow me to touch a little bit and bring you guys to follow through the formation and setup of um, APPG, MSDG, and Secretariat guideline as well as the governance aspect of it, just to echo what uh, Dato Dennison spoke about earlier. Um, Fred, no, I'm not going to go in a very detailed manner, as that will take quite some time. So I'll just briefly explain on what I think is crucial to highlight on. All right. Um, as mentioned by Dr. Denison, um, EPPGM SDG has been approved by the Parliament of Malaysia on October 19, 2019. And happy to say that we are officially just turn one this month, Dr. Uh, and EPPGM SDG is indeed a bipartisan group, which members are among from the Dewan Raya and Dewan Negara. And um, Malaysian CSO SDG Alliance has been appointed as the Secretary to this group where Persatuan Promosi Matlamat Umbangna Lestari is actually the legal entity of it. Um, moving on, um, our mandate is actually uh, to undertake the localizing SDGs at the uh, parliamentary constituency level where the pilot phase 2020 which consisted of 10 parliamentary constituencies is being undertaken over 15 months between January 2019 to March 2021 instead of what we initially planned for only 12 months and obviously the extension and delays are mainly because of the COVID situation in our country. Um, we are also among other things um, responsible in preparing policy research and strategic papers 
where in this context, uh, we have been working very closely with the MPs involved and as well as uh, with the Economy Planning Unit and ICU to further strengthen the localization of SDG as a whole. So as you can see from the screen, the committee members uh, comprise of few MPs from different uh, political parties. The chairman is the YB, that is Sri Hajar Rouhani Abdul Karim, the MP of Batang Lupar, um, YB Pamarachim Abdullah, the deputy chairman, the MP of Petaling Jaya. The secretary, the secretary is the YB Tuan, Tuan William Yong Ji Kim, MP of Selayang, and the treasurer is YB Kelvin Yi Li Wen, MP of Bandar Kuching. And a uh, few other members from Dewan Rakyat, we have uh, YB Tuan Won Tak, MP of Pentong, YB Tuan Ahmad Hassan, um, MP of Papar, and um, Senator Adrian Benny Lassimbang, as well as Senator Datuk Paul Igai from the um, Dewan Negara. So from this lineup, uh, I think one can actually tell that we are in bracket very bipartisan in nature. Um, all right, and then the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the secretariat team comprises of um, head of secretariat, um, Professor Dr. Dr. Dennis Njaya Surya, head of finance, Ms. Lavanya Ramaia from WWF Malaysia, head of research uh, comprises of Mr. Aliza Mahadi from ISIS Malaysia, and Professor Dr. Dr. Professor Dr. Zainal Abidin Sanusi from Sejahtera Center of IUM. And uh, our head solution is uh, Dr. Lin Mui Kiang. The treasurer is Mr. Kon Onsen. And we have seven excellent lead coordinators who excellently coordinate and working hand in hand with us to ensure the smooth running of the projects in each constituency. Um, so for lead coordinators, uh, we have in lights of uh, Professor Dr. Dr. Rashila Ramli of ICMAS UKM, who is excellently takes care of uh, Papa and Pensiangan, Mrs. Omna Srini Ong of Njanda Malaysia, um, who takes care of Patang Sado and Banda Kuching, um, Mr. Kali Awalid from Filandior, who takes care of Kendang, Dr. Juita Mohammed of ISIS Malaysia takes care of Jili, Dr. Morelli of uh, National Cancer Society Malaysia who takes care of Bentong, Mr. Q Jayao, a practicing lawyer and I believe an environmentalist, takes care of Tanjung Piai, Mr. Jeffrey Pang uh, takes care of Selayang, and last but not least, Mr. Aliza Mahadi who took the honor to actually take care of uh, Petaling Jaya. Um, and the program officer is myself, uh, Rahma, and our very reliable finance officer, Mr. Anthony Tan. Um, all right, um, in terms of the governance, once the project team has gone down for the site visit in each constituency, um, as explained previously by Dr. Lin and uh, Chalizan, uh, they would have their issues prioritized and from which uh, project solutions are suggested. This is where the secretary will call in for applications and uh, the proposals that we receive goes to the secretary solution committee, which is headed by um, our beloved Dr. Lin Mui Kiang, before uh, they are presented to the EPPJ MSDG committee, which is checked by the YBs for final approval of the project solutions. Um, in terms of the financial management, uh, to ensure due diligence, the signatories, the chairs, um, as listed over there, Professor Dr. Dr. Deng Sanjaya Surya, Mr. Aliza Mahadi, and Mr. Kon Onsen. And we are required to submit our monthly activity and finance report to Parliament of Malaysia before um, they are being forwarded to MOF afterwards. And um, last but not least, um, I think it is worth highlighting that um, all decision making in Secretariat and APP JMSG as a whole are party secretary and consultative. I think uh, that's all from me, Anthony. Thank you. Over to you. Um, thank you, Raba, for that overview of how the administration uh, is taken care of. I think what is important uh, for us to, to note, uh, number one, um, it takes a, a, a whole group of people coming together to come up with a solution to an uh, existing problem. 
uh, there have been situations where we've been asked by even officers from EPU if there are already 4,000 different programs that have been going on in eradicating poverty since Merdeka, why is it uh, still a problem? And uh, uh, one, of the, one of the main issues, I think, is that uh, there is a lack of coordination between A, the government agencies, B, the NGOs that are able to support, uh, three, uh, communication with the actual uh, stakeholders, the, the people on the ground who require the help, uh, and uh, and also uh, getting academics to uh, come into the picture to review what has happened and and give fresh eyes or to a pre-existing problem. I, I think both Dr. Zainal and uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Alizan will agree that uh, going down to the ground makes a totally world of difference. Uh, I remember Dr. Grayson uh, mentioning going to Pendang, he found himself in a homestay surrounded by paddy fields and having meetings via Zoom, uh, something totally, totally, uh, uh, something that he didn't expect uh, uh, coming into 2020. So I'd like to now open the discussion to questions. If there are, um, I'll check the chat box. Uh, I, I, noticed, yeah. I noticed there is one uh, question or there is a conversation among a number of people on uh, participation. Ah. So if, if anybody wants to raise it as a question, if not, I could make some suggestions and the rest of the team can highlight as well. I sure. noticed that there are a few comments. Uh, if anybody wants to raise it as a question, uh, if not, I can just respond to that. I think you can respond to it directly, Dr. Desai. Okay. I, I think uh, one of the things uh, we would be happy is uh, any uh, current student or former student, especially those who have graduated and are in, uh, you know, your own SDG or CSR programs. Um, next year, we plan to expand to 20 new parliamentary constituencies. So there might be a lot of opportunities for people to participate. Secondly, in this participation, you need to be part of the team that goes out on the field visit. We haven't formalized the 20 locations, but it will be um, in addition to the current 10. So there would be 30. Uh, so the field visits are another option. The third is actually you can be part of some of the solution projects, uh, which is actual delivery of a solution based on um, the prioritization and so forth. So that could be done through an NGO uh, or CSO or even through a social enterprise that is registered. Currently, all our partners are actually registered bodies and they might work with informal local communities. So a lot of opportunities. I think you have Anthony, your, your what is that? Your link person uh, and Rama is also here. Uh, so your area of interest as Dr. Lin has provided education, community development, uh, health, uh, waste management. So there's a whole, um, uh, area, but it's really getting down to a local community and helping to facilitate uh, and bring solutions and document it by, by way of case study and writing and also seeing it sustain beyond just the project period. Thank you, uh, Anthony. Thank you, Dr. Dennis. Um, Karen, do you have uh, a question to pose? Um, sure. Um, I actually have a question regarding Indigenous peoples. Um, this could be to any of the panelists. I noticed that a lot of the solutions projects that have currently been proposed are those uh, to uplift communities economically. Um, I would just like to get the views of the panelists um, uh, in the, from the aspect of uplifting Indigenous peoples economically. 
what is your view on um you know trying to get them to adapt into a modern um capitalist based economy versus what they were used to traditionally as their means of survival uh what is your view on you know them having to make these these kind of adaptations to become part of what is the mainstream um alizan and dr zainal would like to take this question uh, um thank you karen for that question um i think as you can see quite first of all the the one of the uh the key questions that were asked when we go to all the constituencies is who are being left behind the most and and this is where in quite a lot of the constituencies uh, it was obvious that the indigenous peoples were um were some of the communities that were left behind the most um it's just similar to my to my comments on being contextual also in the case of indigenous communities no single indigenous community is the same and we really have to to understand that as well so there are indigenous communities that are more um uh in, intertwined with the modern livelihoods so we cannot deny that to them as well and and some indigenous communities they would like to participate in in uh, the socio modern socio economy um as well there are those that are not um so it really is contextual to the different uh indigenous communities especially if we talk about orang asal in, in sabah and sarawak as well uh it, it is it differs greatly uh, nonetheless um it is quite obvious that especially for those that actually do want to participate in the modern socio economy that they are being left behind and they are struggling for that um i remember in jelly for example they were collecting thing bamboo and they just got one ringgit for um for one uh, meter or, or something along those lines um and then on the other hand there is this view from certain agencies saying that the indigenous people are very dependent and they are lazy yeah <laughs> uh, going back to the the myth of the lazy native um so there there's that fragmentation into understanding really the context of of the indigenous people so we can see when we talk with when we speak with the agencies they said you know they they are very dependent they we need to set up everything from them but, but when we speak to them they say well we are willing to participate in this uh uh you know even the modern social economy but you need to reward us accordingly so and so i'll just say that one it depends on which indigenous community but even those that do want to participate you know we really need to rethink and reframe how we think of indigenous communities maybe dr zaina wants to add uh karen that's very interesting uh you 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 use the word adapt or adapt yeah adapt maybe adapt but my 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 take on that is that uh, should we look it in a way that how we define the premise of development that they are the ones going to adapt to us uh if we look if we talk about sustainable development is about localizing why can't we localizing to their great traditional and indigenous knowledge that's where sustainability is so that that kind of paradigm uh, is still like we thought that development uh, is for them to be modernized but we know for sure they cannot eat panadol for example they get sick to eat panadol but we give them panadol so this is a kind of thing that we try to somehow uh, be in between some group would like to be adapted yeah some group would like to stay there and we want them to be stay there so what we do as as a uh, solution to that is that our most recent project which is outside a bit of the appg project we are working with uh, the pre and pre service and in service training for teachers who are orang asli so what we do now is to develop their so called rimbagogi I mean, their pedagogy that use rimbagogi which inside is, is a traditional knowledge so manenya we try to bring that as one of the alternative curricula so we are empowering them to use their own knowledge so that they feel that oh their knowledge become mainstream and they are allowed to do that rather than being pushed to somehow getting the impressions that you got to follow the national curriculum so try to be a bit practical in that lah and anthony i just want to make two interventions um, 
I, I know you addressed it to Alizan and Zainal. I was going to come to you as an anthropologist. Okay, okay. <laughs> but uh, I, I wanted Dr. Lin, if she can comment, uh, because I listed uh, just now uh, in six of the parliamentary constituencies, indigenous people are the target, Jelly, Bentong, Batang Sadong, uh, Pen, uh, Penciangan, Papar, and even the Kuching, uh, Kampong Chawan is actually uh, uh, Ibans, right? Uh, it's actually uh, rural natives who, who migrated to the urban and specific programs, uh, whether it's economic or educational, I think Dr. Lin might. I just want to raise with you, Karen, that in SDGs, it's already challenging the fundamental premise of the economic system. So it's not that, um, I, I know uh, Zainal commented about modernization, adaptation, I don't go there. I'm just raising the fundamental uh, ideology of business. So neoliberal business ideology, in some sense, SDG is challenging the very premises that business is not for just profits. Business has economic, social, environmental uh, objectives. So the social impact has to be there as well. Uh, so I think Dr. Zainal is right that the economic model that we then develop is not creating a plantation for orang aslis uh, to lend their land to a development agency that then gives them a dividends. That's one model. The model that we are seeing coming from the SDG is helping them do uh, organic farms. So it's training, it's getting them to uh, toil the land uh, and develop organic and do uh, uh, community supported agriculture method by linking the producers with the consumers through some marketing and other forms. So the Benton project is developing that. So these are alternatives. I think ecotourism uh, is the one while it's not focused on indigenous in Tanjung Pia, uh, it's definitely with uh, eight uh, Malay kampongs uh, surrounding that area in Tanjung Pia. So it's challenging the very foundation of business and business models uh, that it's big business, it is big investment, uh, but that the small micro businesses uh, can have a community transforming effect that must have social as well as environmental impact. So SDGs bring that out uh, is the theme. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, I thought in case they want to know a bit more of the projects, then Dr. Lin can come to uh, show Dr. specific. Yeah, sorry, Dr. Lin, would you like to add in? Yes. Uh, in fact, we have a number of projects for the Orang Asli or Orang Asal, because sometimes, you know, they are, they are so different. When we talk about orang asli, we think they're they are in the jungle. And then, you know, when you talk about orang asal, they're also living in the towns and, you know, all over Sabah and Sarawak. So it is, we cannot lump them into one category. And uh, we have a few projects for them, in fact, like for for the orang asli bentong uh, organic farm and to uh, try to link them with the uh, fair trade uh, networks and so forth. Uh, then we have the mushroom cultivation in jelly, also for orang asli, the uh, fish farming, uh, curly catfish farming, also for orang asli, and the traditional crafts, also for orang asli. And Persiangan, they have a lot of socioeconomic problem about the uh, women's rights, uh, children's rights, high child, child marriages, and so forth. There's a whole big program to, to cover three villages there to help them, you know, to provide information, awareness, uh, mindset changes, and so forth. Because they are really, this group in the interior are really not connected with uh, what is happening outside. 
And then we have another one uh, in Kampung Chawan, the squatter area village is actually Dayaks and Ibans. And then we are going to another group, which is uh, also uh, Selangau Batu, is a lot of uh, Dayaks, Ibans, uh, 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 Vidayus and Chinese. So they, they do live like that, you know, all mixed up. And uh, so, but the important pro, uh, uh, factor here is consultation. We have to really connect with them to find out what, they, what their situation is, what they really need, what, do, what they want. For example, the, uh, the uh, Kampung Chawan. So if there was house to house needs assessment survey and uh, we recruited six girls uh, uh, they are like uh, they have finished school and they're going on to tertiary education and they did a wonderful job surveying every household uh, from everybody in the household it's uh, like a census so they came up with a whole list of things they need and they want so that's how we we uh, finalized that project and uh, and they are so enthusiastic, you know, you see the photographs of the children going for tuition, you know, the, how they do the gotong royong to clean up the area. And because this is something that they want and they really participated really full heartedly. But there are some other areas like uh, the uh, Orang Asli Organic Farm in Tentong. We need to really find out from them what is this what they really want? Because they have alternative ways of livelihood. You know, some of them have even a small rubber, small holding, or they, or they go and collect red tan or collect banana leaves and all that. So, you know, whether, we, whether they really want to settle down to do farming, which is very regimented, also is quite hard work. You have to water your plants. You have to, you know, have, Every day there is a schedule to follow, things like that. So, so it is not one size fits all, it's, they are not uniform. So the important thing is consultation and finding out what they really need and want. Um, thank you, Dr. Lin. Uh, I'm from the clock. I see it's already 11.26, it's coming towards the end of our discussion. So I'm, I'm going to track back uh, from uh, Rama, do you have anything to, to add to our conversation, Rama? A A Anthony, I see yeah. Prashila around. Ah, oh. okay, she wants yes. to make an intervention. Yes, good, on... good morning, and, and uh, would you like to, to share from your perspective as a, as a lead coordinator for Sabah? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I know we just have just a couple of minutes. Uh, just to link back with what Dr. Lin was saying, uh, because I'm the lead coordinator for Sabah, so we have two areas, which is Papar and Persiangan. In Persiangan, we really had to deal with the Murut uh, group, and uh, really a lot of things have to be you know, translated to the language. We, we really have to be on the ground, and this is the issue concerning uh, women's health and uh, child's rights as well. So uh, uh, we're going into three particular uh, villages and because of COVID right now, a lot of things are on the standstill, but uh, these are the things that we're going forward. Um, there are a couple, just a couple of things to add. Uh, the fact that SDG is very integrated uh, in a lot of the projects that we're doing, you know, you're covering two or three SDGs at the same time. So it's not something which is very silo in its approach. Uh, secondly, this of course links to what Dr. Zainal was saying just now. It is very multidisciplinary in approach. The fact that, for example, I work from a political science perspective, but when you go to the ground, you know, you have to take in sociology, you have to take in communications, you have to deal with the economies. So there are different ways to look at it. And the thirdly, the fact that we have to deal with many multi, uh, with multi stakeholders. Uh, and when we're dealing with that, you know, it is the, the question of breaking silos uh, between uh, government agencies, the communities, the academics. So this is a very enriching program indeed. And uh, if there are others based on the conversation, 
uh, yeah, there are many rooms for others to join in, especially next year when we, as mentioned by Dato Denison, there will be another 20 projects, come, uh, 20 constituencies uh, coming through. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anthony. Thank you, Prof. Rashila. Um, okay, uh, Rama, if uh, Rama is not here, Dr. Lin, would you like to add in? Uh, I, I, I think this is a very rewarding kind of uh, initiative which we can do and we really want to expand it to other constituencies now that mm -hmm. some kind of uh, experience I think we can um, do better next time. Yep. Uh, Dr. Zainal, I know you're always Sujatra, so you can share some of that with us. No, we can't hear you. Okay, I think, yeah, I was following in one ear and then the other ear is like focusing on the chat box. <laughs> I was replying to the chat box. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have much to say anymore. I have said my experience and reflections on it. Thank you. Um, Alizan? I just uh, thank you once again for organizing. I think the key thing here and what we have been experiencing um, is it is all learning by doing, but really the focus is on problem solving. I think it's, it's sometimes it's both as simple and as complex as that. When you talk about problem solving, it has to cut across silos, it has to address contextual issues, etc. But again, when you go back to um, the education system in general, sometimes um, this disciplinary thing uh, is, is important because, you know, as an academic, you, you stand on the shoulders of giants and you need to build upon existing work. But then uh, the world is full of crises now and, and the focus should be problem solving. Uh, my, my final um, addition is just to say that, um, to be fair, there has been a lot of work on the ground before this. But the key difference is that this is done on a national level. So it's on the ground, but it's done on a national level. So there's the benefits in terms of comparative uh, and so on. And it's also linking to the parliamentary system as well. So yes, I hope um, um, more people come on board. Uh, you know, we, we could use, uh, we could definitely use more people. So uh, thank you. Thank you for okay, that. Just before I invite Dr. Denison to, to share a few words, I noticed that uh, Dr. Zainal has come up with a new SDG, SDG 18, caring. Something for us to probably bring up to the UN. Uh, Dr. Denison. Okay, I, I think the, uh, you know, just to comment because you mentioned about caring, I think the whole uh, social work area is shifting from relief welfare approach uh, to a more rights-based approach to development in a more integrated way. So the SDGs provide that, as Alizan just now raised, not in silo, uh, but in the interconnectedness uh, and the multidisciplinary approach to addressing a problem. So it could be economic, but that economic must also link with the environment, social, uh, and so forth. I just wanted to, uh, uh, I mean, a lot has been said and time taken, uh, but because there are also people uh, undertaking research and some of you as what Dr. Zainal was uh, highlighting some uh, research implications. I think the methodology that we are using, although we didn't use the word here is actually action research. Action research has a participatory approach. So the researcher becomes a participant, uh, not just as an observer, but as an active participant in the process of uh, working with the people, documenting, uh, identifying, prioritizing, and then exercising some solutions uh, to the problems identified and then staying on to see 
whether the solutions are really impactful or not, and then coming back again. So if we had the funding and as we go on, the process is now, uh, with COVID now delayed a bit, but it's overall about 15 months in the first cycle. And I think Alizan's team is going into the second phase of research to look at the micro data with uh, census report, uh, statistics departments, uh, more comprehensive uh, data at the district or kampong level, moving beyond the micro. But that action research, if we do it, is actually a longitudinal study which should expand beyond a year to at least two or three years. And if we take SDGs moving on till 2020, then we have more time, but it's the capacity and personnel to document this research with this local community to see if there is impactful change from an SDG perspective. It's not just income, it's various other forms. So action research is important. So I think your master students at Sunway uh, could use one of our locations as the living lab. It's the living lab. So the person can actually go down with the team if the next team is going to go out in March or April next year, then your students can go out, start collating the material, go back to the location uh, or to specific target groups in that area and then uh, write it. And if someone is as motivated as Anthony is, then from masters, they might move on to a doctorate level. Yes, uh, yes. Not just permanent head damage, but permanent hair loss, is it? <laughs> hair damage. That's, that's interesting. Damage. Okay. So that's it from us. And, uh, and we thank you, Karen and the Sunway team uh, for having all of us. Uh, we can be involved in specific areas if you wanted talks or sessions or even tutorial or specific because there might be environment, there might be culture related. I see Dr. Zainal's point on biodiversity and there are researchers in the team. We didn't list all the public universities, uh, but uh, all the ground researchers are from public universities. So that exposure of resource persons in specific fields uh, might be quite useful. So that's it from me, Anthony. Thank you to the team. Team, I think it's very fruitful to have us all in one, one meeting uh, is itself great uh, spending this uh, Saturday morning together, all because of Anthony Tan, who celebrate, celebrate him graduating at master <laughs> level. Maybe we can pull him through to see he becomes Dr. Anthony Tan. You know, you got so many professors here. Even Rashila can supervise you. <laughs> okay, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dennison. Uh, thank you, Prof. Rashila, for your intervention. Uh, Dr. Zainal, uh, Dr. Lin, uh, I think Alizan may have left, and also Rama. Um, I'd just like to take a few minutes to, to say that uh, my research project, too, is actually based on, on the work uh, being done in the APPGM SDG. Um, my topic was, uh, was basically the importance of SDG 17 in uh, bringing success to the Sustainable Development Goals. And what I found, and Dr. Dennison touched about it a little bit, we have various groupings of uh, stakeholders. Uh, Dr. Zainal and Alizan form one part of it, which is the researchers. Uh, I think uh, before this, we didn't have a listing of different researchers of different fields uh, in, in, in one page. Uh, but now we have that. Um, we have parliamentarians who are able to work together. I, I actually witnessed eight MPs come to a decision faster in half an hour than what they took four hours in parliament. 
Uh, so it is a cross party and, and we have a good good understanding between the MPs. Uh, the silos that exist within federal, state and, and, and local agencies, that's something that has to be broken. Um, the inclusion of uh, NGOs, the CSO SDG Alliance itself has 50 different NGOs, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is growing. And it is one of the very few uh, umbrella bodies where we have diverse uh, interests from human rights all the way to uh, environment, law, and, and, and uh, women's rights, children's rights. So these are groups that uh, I, I found uh, as major stakeholders within the, the uh, getting the SDGs on the ground. And uh, what Dr. Dennison mentioned is true. Uh, during uh, writing the, the research project, not only did I have Prof. Uh, Leong as my supervisor, I had 10 PhDs backing me up with my data, including, including Dr. Lin uh, looking at all the projects because uh, it's not a one person effort. Uh, and, and I've been convinced totally that bringing SDG on the, to the ground is something that uh, needs everyone's participation. Uh, it takes a whole village to bring up a child. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Jeffrey Sachs Center for allowing the APPGM SDG to, to share our experience together. Uh, Dr. Denison, do you have something to say? No, I thought I was going to take a photo, but, but that's okay because I'm not sure whether <laughs> the students want to on their cameras or not. So it's okay. It's all right. Maybe I, everyone could switch on their cameras before we say goodbye. Yeah, uh, so, if they want to, then we can take a group photo. Anthony? Uh, it, it would be good to see how many people have kept mustache and what not. Whether they change, uh, huh. whether they, they, they turn white or not since, <laughs> since, since joining the course. Oh, Sam, so clean. <laughs> While everyone is turning on their cameras, may I just take this opportunity to thank all of you for your generosity in sharing your experiences with us today. Um, I think I speak on behalf of all the postgraduate students of Sunway University who are present here today to say that um, this session has been truly enlightening and, um, and you know, it, it is so different from our regular classrooms. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, if it were up to me, I would make this session a compulsory viewing for, for all the students moving forward. So thank you once again. And thank you, Anthony, for putting this together.